long term, I, I'm definitely more on the bearish side. Basically, what I'm saying is I'm going more with the data. I want to show you guys something here that's pretty remarkable. I'm going to go to the S&P 500. When it, whenever these uh, have happened in the past, they've ended previous bear markets. Look at the similarities in price action. Mm. To me, when I see what's going on with the regional banks, it's not necessarily the straw that's going to break the camel's back, but it certainly is a tremor before what I think is going to be more tremors and eventually a big earthquake for the system. That's going to be the big warning sign for me that, whoa, something is not right. All right, guys, hello and welcome. We're joined here by a good friend and trader, Gareth Soloway of InTheMoneyStocks.com. Uh, Gareth has been a trader for almost 20 years, I think probably more than that. Gareth, how are you, by the way? You're well? Yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Very lucky of you to be in Florida and enjoying that good weather. <laughs> okay, let's get uh, straight to it. So what are your views on the stock market overall? I mean, there's a lot of debt, obviously, in the news. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this. A lot of talk about uh, possible debt defaults. I don't know how much you buy into that, but generally overall, what's your view What's uh, on the stock market, S&P, um, long-term wise? Long-term, I'm definitely more on the bearish side. It's, you know, the to me, when I see what's going on with the regional banks, it's not necessarily the straw that's gonna break the camel's back, but it certainly is a tremor before what I think is going to be more tremors and eventually a big earthquake for the system. Um, so again, you know, you look at how fast the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, it's hard for the system to handle that and for people to think that you know oh it's we're going to have a soft landing oh we're going to have a minor recession and the fed has said just something very minor i find that hard to believe considering how aggressively they've raised and how supposedly unless inflation gets back to two percent they're not going to be printing any new money or lowering rates and so for me i'm, I'm definitely on the longer term view, more bearish. Shorter term, I think we discussed it before, this could be a little bit of a cup right here with a little consolidation of a handle. So there might be, it's possible move up. Um, maybe kind of, this would be kind of a target that I'm looking at 430. I think that was kind of one of the levels you pointed out on the S&P yeah. around 4,300, right? So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. that would be something that I would kind of watch. If we did break this this level on the spiders here, then it makes sense that that would be your next upside target. So again, shorter term, a little bit more bullish, but over the bigger term, the next six, 12 months, I remain unbelievably bearish. I wanna show you guys something here that's pretty remarkable. I'm gonna go to the S&P 500, all right? So in fact, this will be really kind of powerful, I think. So if we flip over to this chart, all right? So we take a look, this is the S&P weekly chart. You guys can see this screen too with Google, Yeah, right? yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Psychology of the market. All right. So you guys know, I, I believe that trading is mostly trading humans, right? Human emotion. Um, and what we could see here, this is what's called the psychology of the market chart, which talks about the different stages of the market. Yes. You, have, you, you know, disbelief down here, hope, optimism, belief, thrill, euphoria, pullback, complacency and then anxiety denial, and you have the bigger collapse. So what I want you to do is focus on this move up here, the initial yep. pullback and then this sideways consolidation. Now let's flip back to this chart. Look at the, it's almost identical, identical. So mm -hmm. again, here we have the big move up, the initial pullback and then the consolidation. So for me, this is a stage of complacency in the market and it could go on from what, from another few months, but eventually this leads to the next leg down in the markets that probably takes us significantly lower. Um, for me, I, I think, you know, again, it's, it's price levels will break, um, mm -hmm. but I really honestly could see us retesting at, at minimum the pre-COVID highs from uh, February, which is on the S&P around 33 to 3,400. And then I even think we could even get lower to the 3,000 level uh, by early next year, I think. So So again, definitely more on the macro bearish side. Um, let me show you guys one more chart. This is just something I, I came across um, yeah. literally yesterday, and I want to bring it to you guys. Uh, let me show let me i'm going to split this into two screens here yeah okay so so here's the chart of the this is the weekly chart of the nasdaq here and what i want to do over here is bear with me as i go all the way back on my screen to 2000 yes okay and i want to show you oh, guys the dot com, the dot com crash yes, dot I, com. the bubble yeah look at the similarities in price action mm. Look at the move up with the dot coms, the initial drop, and the bounce and choppy consolidation. Over here, 
Here's your move up from COVID, your pullback, your sideways consolidation. It's very, very eerily similar. And we know that in the dot-com situation, what ended up happening, we had this next leg down, which was, I think the NASDAQ fell 78%. I don't know if the NASDAQ will fall 78% in this situation, mm. but it's more the general case for the, the macro being bearish is the replication of this chart. And again, going back to the human psychology chart, we see it over repeating over and over again. So that's kind of freaky. The other thing that's just a really cool thing um, here, uh, let me show you here, price range, right? So if we take the high of the dot-com to the initial pullback right here, okay, yes. it's about 38% on the initial dip. And if we do that same thing over here, you want to know how much it is to the low <laughs> here? Yeah. 38%. 38%. So, Interesting. And then you got the bounce, which has got started this consolidation. So the big question I have is uh -huh. in this bounce here, where are we? Now you pointed out that next level here, which if if this is correct, if if what you're saying, if let's say let's say 4,300 is, is your target on the S P, give or take, where would mm -hmm. that be on this chart? Well, that tells us that we do have upside and it would double top right here, right? So this high. And then if we look over here, look at this high and this high. Yeah. Before the fall came in, so again, you know, just this is this is what I have fun with doing. I love looking at history. <laughs> yeah, kind of yeah, me too. Me what too. Similarities there are because, to be honest, not a lot of people spend time doing this, and I think that's no. one of the reasons it's so useful. I agree. I have a question that this this has intrigued me. How much of a retracement was that bounce in twenty in two thousand in the year two thousand? Yep, that's uh, on that's on that big thing I did. So basically, from down here to up here, you had about a 35% rally off the lows. And then and over was that a 30, here- Was that a 50% or 61.8% retracement of the prior decline? Oh, uh, retracement, I'm not sure. Let me just let me just do the number over here just real yeah, quick sure. and then we'll do the retrace. Uh, let me go to this here. And so if we were to go to 35%, it would take us kind of mm. right up to where your targets are. It'd actually be a little bit yeah. higher than that previous point, somewhere in this in this level on the NASDAQ. Uh -huh. So it's just kind of interesting that if that, that does potentially mean that we could go a little higher before the bigger rollover um, in the near term here. Now, in terms of a retrace, let's let's do a quick fib. So you're yeah. looking at from, from here yep. down to these lows. So it was around a 50%, maybe just oh, above 50%. 50%. And then let me just do it over here. I know I'm getting the charts are getting a little messy here, but. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Oh, interesting. So what we were saying is it could go a little bit higher, potentially mm -hmm. to equal that, it would be about a 618 retrace on the NASDAQ uh -huh. to get, that would be right up where if the same percentage bounce, if you get the same bounce here yes. from these lows here, it would actually be a almost identical 618. Yeah. That's a very interesting um, comparison. I mean, that's, that's certainly intrigued me. That's very interesting. I do see the case. I do. I think you make a very strong case for the bearish perspective. I'm, I'm I'm not respect your point of view. Uh, I'm just maintaining a long-term bullish view for a bull market. I could be wrong, but I do find your perspective very interesting. And I'm going to be one one thing you just mentioned here, uh, Gareth, is one one thing which uh, you, you made me realize in this particular video, which has helped me, is I think I'm going to be watching those levels with a lot of interest because if those levels that you mentioned and the, those are levels I'm watching as well. You're absolutely right. I am watching those levels of resistance, those comparison that you made. Uh, I think if the market really sees, um, you know, if, if bears suddenly come in, if that is, happens, if that is, if sellers and bears suddenly come in at those levels, um, then we need to be on high alert. We need to be, we need to be extremely aware and um, very careful. If indeed at those levels we see a lot of selling pressure or downside pressure from those levels. No, I agree. I agree. Exactly. Now, just out of curiosity, like, so I mean, I've been trying to rack my brain for the bull case about how we get back to all time highs. And I, mm -hmm. I would love to hear your perspective on that of like what. So so for me, it's saying, OK, well, you know, assuming we have inflation that right now is even from the jobs number this morning, it was relatively it was a very strong yeah. number. And so that's going to keep in fact, wage gains were higher. The wage increases were higher. So that's inflationary. So how do how do we without the fed i mean or or is your thesis that the fed does come in aggressively and starts printing money again and that's how we get there well the thing is that as i'm sure you know yourself uh, gareth uh, i see markets being driven mostly largely by sentiment by emotion of greed and fear and i do pay attention to the fed and all that but to me um the whole thing about the fed i find it i find it detracts from my analysis and it makes me uh 
it, it hinders my analysis. And in, in when I bring in the whole Fed, I do think when the Federal Reserve eventually starts cutting rates, just as with the previous times they've done this, whenever they start, history shows this, whenever the Federal Reserve has gone from raising rates to, to cutting. cutting rates, just like they did in 2008, I think they did this, and all, 2007, 2008. And also they did this in 2000, uh, 2001, I think it was. Um, the market reversed and crashed, went massively lower. Right. So I do agree with you. I do pay attention to the Fed, but only the one thing I'm waiting for is when the Federal Reserve decides to cut rates. That's going to be the big warning sign for me that, whoa, something is not right. And then I'll get bearish when that happens, when they start cutting rates. But gotcha. the one uh, you're asking what, what's make, what makes me bullish, there's a lot of data um, to do with market breadth that shows when it, whenever these uh, have happened in the past, they've ended previous bear markets and started new ones. So I'll just give you an example. Um, there's one market breadth which looks at, sorry, thrust or volume thrusts. Mm -hmm. uh, now I know these things can always be false signals too. I'm not denying that. There is one also looking at the percentage of stocks in the S&P. I did a video about this. That when the percentage of stocks in the S&P with a rising 200 MA, goes over 75%. In the past, the signal has never failed. It's always shown the end of a previous bear market, the start of a new bull market to all time highs. People may say the sample data may be small and that may be true, but I'm going with, basically what I'm saying is I'm going more with the data. And that, those are just some of the data. There's a lot more that shows that from a breadth, from the market breadth perspective, we could go significantly higher, maybe 16 to 20% in the next, uh, perhaps by next year. I could be wrong. Yeah, and I could be wrong here. Uh, I just let uh, everyone know. Uh, but I'm maintaining that bullish perspective as long as we stay above key support, let's say the March lows. That makes sense. Um, yeah, but just let me just say that, um, again, I respect your point of view. And I one thing you mentioned in this video, which has certainly been interesting, and I think people, uh, guys, let us know in the comments what you think. Uh, what are your views on what what Gareth showed with the comparison charts. That should be quite interesting. Let's see people people say that. Uh, Gareth, that's been a really interesting perspective. Tell us a bit more about how people can learn more about yourself and how people can get access to your trading material and service. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. It's, it's honestly an honor to chat with you. Um, so for me, it's in the money stocks.com is where I, I, I have a service called verified investing alerts. Uh, in that service, I put out trade signals. Uh, so anytime I see a trade signal on a commodity or a stock, I'm alerting members uh, to go long or go short, where to take profits, all that stuff. And I do a daily video, which gives in-depth analysis on the macro view, the stock, the view, the commodities and so forth. Thanks very much, Gareth.